Cowabunga, and welcome to my cellar. Uh, got a lot of comments, so uh, I'm going to uh, rip through the ones I decided I'd, I wanted to address. First one, though, thanks for not commenting on politics or the metaphysical. I game and listen to channels like this to get a break from all that. Yeah, um, arguing about God or arguing about politics is one of the more futile exercises that mankind's come up with because you aren't going to change anybody's mind just like that. So I don't bother. I don't care. I'm a gamer. Whatever else I do, how I cast my ballot, I was an election official for several years and, and completely nonpartisan. Um, all of my players trying to get an edge by metagaming. I just don't think it can be helped. Maybe someday I'll write a story about how I learned to stop worrying and love the metagaming. Well, we're going to address that some more in another one up, so I'm going to save it for, for now. Um, okay. This is about what I uh, read online last night. Your real friends, and more importantly, your friends, as what they all have become, need no explanations about your leaving TSR. You're an honorable man, a good man, and unlike the dumpster fire that the company who will not be named is, you have a legacy that will be a boon forever to gamers, and you've done, you've done more before your 21st, 23rd birthday than that horrible raccoon who runs that dumpster fire has in his entire life. Um, your world will always be good enough. Well, mm, 23rd birthday, no, that's a stretch. Uh, I was 26 when I went to work at TSR. <laughs> but yeah, by my, by my 30th, uh, I, I would agree with that sentiment. Yeah, he's a douchebag. Um, there's <laughs> no two ways around it. Um, and a comment to that response was, the company who will not be named isn't even a company. I'm not sure it ever was. Well, yeah, it's a um, <laughs> pretty sketchy uh, proposition altogether. Um, okay, uh, commenting on uh, board games, which I'm going to comment on more later. Um, 878 Vikings is pretty good. I've only played it once, but I really loved it. The one I own from Academy Games is 1775 Rebellion, which I also love. They make good games. Yeah, I'd have to agree with you. They do... Uh, they do have an overall uh, reputation for good games, fun to play, uh, reasonably historical, and because they purport to be, and I can't fault any of the history or anything like that. I wouldn't pretend to anyway. But yeah, they do make good games. And this, one, this comment was uh, addressed to um, my producer, Jim. Best movie clip ever! <laughs> yeah, that, uh, that, that clip from... Um, uh, Blazing Saddles got a lot of comments this week, and um, it, it it pretty much sums up the way I look at melee, particularly or melee or melee, whatever you call it. Um, how I look at it is a big swirling, just punch the, punch a guy, and if you don't recognize him, punch him in the face. Um, and uh, yeah, it was a nice it was a nice bit of of, uh, of humor. Um, I understand the only, he only has one spell, so it hits mechanic required by Gary's general early disdain for magic mechanics. Frankly, I really dig the Dungeon Crawl Classics, Mutant Crawl Classics version of Magic Casters. Cast a spell, rolling a d20, and add your level modifier and intelligence, and yada da da da, da and have a hit to, have it to hit difficulty class. Uh, okay, I'm not going to go into the mechanics, right? You don't forget your... And you see if it happens. It did it happen badly. You don't forget it uh, unless you roll a 1, in which case you're out of luck. Um, anybody can read a scroll and try to cast, but the results are very unpredictable. Um, yeah, um, and see, here's, here's the thing that uh, a lot of people that want to home rule uh, stuff don't don't take into enough consideration, I believe, and that is that it's very, very dangerous to lift a portion 
of one game and plug it into another. Because if, if either of the two are good to begin with, in fact, the better they are on their own, the more unlikely it is that you're going to mash parts of them together. Because uh, MCC, D&D, &D, okay, uh, or uh, D DCC M and D&D, &D, okay, that system works for them because of the nature of the design, the style of play. It might not work as well for something along a Pathfinder or or D&D uh, &D itself or um, Hackmaster. It, it might not. You can't just lift. It, it's not, you know, there's, there's a reason they do tissue matches on transplant people, patients. You can't just take my heart and stick it in somebody else's if the tissue doesn't match. And pulling pieces of one system and trying to jer jam them into another you run that very real risk and a system shock of a different sort. Um, you know, it works, it works great for those two games because that is the zeitgeist, that is the overall exuberance they land in playing those games. Yeah, hell yes, let's give it a chance. Let's give it a try. And uh, I, I respect that and I admire it. But I don't think you can just pull that into another system. Um, you have to be very careful when you start swapping bits and pieces out of systems. On the subject of metagaming, how do you mitigate it? I, do try, I try to use description as my first line of defense. I find folks don't describe things to the players that their PC could not know. A lot of DMs just tell you players find X and it's an X and it goes Y and regardless of your knowledge base of the PCs. I was guilty of this when I was a kid DMing at first. I wonder sometimes how much metagaming DMs actually create themselves. My second line of defense is games mechanics and NPC interactions. Um, There's a, we're going to talk about metagaming. There's another question that deals with metagaming. How do I mitigate it? I don't allow it. Plain and simple. You're the DM. If that character can't possibly understand or know this fact, then don't allow it. It's that easy. Don't allow it. You're not there to be the player's friends, though you might be. You're there to fairly and equitably run the game, operate the mechanics on their behalf as they interact with those mechanics. Don't allow it. I don't just say, oh, you found a such and such. Um, if you're playing one of my games, you get a lot of description. And I, and I don't just go, oh, yeah, and you notice. No. If the party goes, okay, I'm going to look at the walls. Do I find anything unusual? And I'll decide whether or not they do, whether there's anything to be found. All right. And depending upon what they tell me, what they're doing to search, I'll tell them what they found. Now, the only time I might violate that tenet is if going into an area gives you a bad vibe and the hair on your neck rises up or something like that. <coughs> Otherwise, tell me what you're doing. I don't just assume that you checked the room. If that were the case, boy, would you be out of luck in some games I've written and had a hand in when we hide junk in the in the junk, hide good stuff in the junk in the corner, the pile of detritus? If you don't tell me you're looking through it, you don't find it, period. Um, next, we'll, and we'll get back to that in a minute. 
Okay, I've opened the board game door. I would love to know your top five or so favorite games. All right, in no particular order, I went around and I looked. 878 Vikings, obviously, and the expansion. Feudality, a Tom Wom game that has infinite replayability again and again and again and again, and it'll never come out the same. And it's got Tom Wom's um, wonderfully twisted sense of humor running through it all. Uh, Fight in the Skies, which we're going to talk about more in a few minutes. Power Grid. That's another rather abstract game that can be very fun to play, especially if all the players know the game well. Um, Escape from Cold, it's one of my favorite, all-time favorite board games, Escape from Cold. It takes all night to play. Who cares? If you find um, enough other people that, that want to play it, who cares if it takes all night to play? And it really doesn't once you get more familiar with it. Um, Fire and Axe. Nice, abstract uh, game of Viking exploration. Abstract, though. Um, and then there's a, a, a board... It, I don't know if it's a board game or if it's a miniatures game. It uses hexes and it uses figures and it's played on a tabletop. Anyway, it's called Samurai Battles. Love the game. It uses a fire and um, command and co command and colors. Oh hell, that's gonna bug me now. It uses a proven uh, system that's been adapted into other games and it fits in quite nicely. Um, lots and lots of uh, scenarios available for it. Okay, regarding Fight in the Sky. I love the game. However, found the mechanics when maneuvering to fire your opponent's tail or weak spot was cumbersome. Do you agree with this? Nope. What would you change in the game if you could? Nothing. I will also add I wish the game had built-in scenarios to help players get more involved. Okay, that I'll concede. That all right, but now let's look at the game. Inspired by the Blue Max. Written by a young man when he was in high school. And I still say that I have not found a more fun, better game involving flying in World War I than Fight in the Skies. I, every time something comes out, now there, there, there is a, a system called Ace of Aces. It's an older system. I don't even know how much of it's still in print, if any of it. But it was a booklet that had you sitting in your cockpit of your plane, seeing what was ahead of you through your windscreen, whilst maneuvering, trying to get a bead on that other guy in the sky. And you're doing this simultaneously. So you're swanning about and going different places. And um, unless you are a very skilled pilot, which the skill level is reflected in Fight in the Skies with its uh, tailing rules. Is it cumbersome? Yes. And was it cumbersome? Yes. If you read uh, some of the accounts uh, written after the war by some of the pilots, they'll tell you, they, you'll, you'll notice that there's a word, particularly amongst the British, that gets tossed around a bit, and it's called kites. Because that's essentially what they were flying was big powered kites, nose heavy kites. And they didn't come at you nice and level. No, they came at you doing this and doing that. And they were subject to crosswinds, very subject to winds aloft, very much subject to it. Um, and so 
the best movie to look at that I feel does the most accurate depiction of biplane fighting is the Blue Max. The pilots that they hired were very good. The planes were either real or um, strut by strut reconstructions, uh, um, 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 uh, reproductions, I should say. And um, it's really hard to get around. That's what the tailing rules are for. You don't have to be directly behind. You have to be in that arc, that cone behind. Then you can declare a tail, and then they can try to shake it. But it's hard to shake a tail unless you're a much better pilot than the guy who's tailing you. So no, I, I wouldn't change anything in the game. Uh, I consider Mike Carr, the uh, man that developed it, a good friend. And um, I, I wouldn't have the temerity to go to someone who has created a system I think is so good and say, oh, but it could be a little better if. Because that, for one thing, I haven't put in the research. And then let's think about it. You're shooting machine gun bullets in short bursts, or else you're just jamming your gun or overheating it in either case you're screwed. You're shooting, you know, five, six, eight shots at a kite. Okay, you're shooting at a kite. And so, unless you hit a strut or control line or something of that nature, okay, you're, you're making him whistle, but you haven't effectively uh, impacted his ability to stay aloft. You got to hit something serious. You got to break a strut. You got to shoot up a wing rut, um, snap some mail, you know, snap off an aileron, uh, take out a section of the wires, make the wings collapse. It's, you know, it's. Uh, except for a few horribly mismatched periods of time, for instance, Bloody April for the Allies, where the life expectancy was six flights or something, six sorties. Um, other than those periods of terrible mismatch, in other words, toward the end of the wall when the pilots were roughly equal, the planes were roughly equal, um, you still didn't have a lot of, uh, there wasn't something to talk about on every mission. Many of the patrols were lonely, boring, and cold. Uh, okay. Would it have helped to have some scenarios? Perhaps. Um, it was designed, pardon me, I dropped something. Oh, it wasn't important. Uh, it was designed by a wargamer for wargamers. Um, knowing that other wargamers are going to look at it and they already assumed a certain level of comprehension or whatever. Um... Have I ever used games or a game as an educator? If so, which games and what subjects did you use? What were your goals? Was it successful? Well, when I was doing some um, observation work, um, I worked with a um, AP history teacher that used a uh, stripped down version of diplomacy to um, model the end of uh, the colonialism period. And I, I thought he did a really interesting job. It was very ab much abstracted. There wasn't any combat, but the presence of fleets and armies and, you know, what have you. Now, I, on the other hand, had, and when I was getting my master's, I had to develop I had to do a project, you know, like a term paper. So I developed a game for um, a history class, 
that I successfully used over the course of a semester at uh, Northwest High School here in Cin uh, suburban Cincinnati. And I called it the PRISM Project. And um, it was, I took the class and I arbitrarily broke them up into nationalities. And I watched for clicks and, you know, tight friends and broke them up on purpose. I wanted to make five or six groups of, okay, they knew who each other were, but essentially strangers or, or just uh, very uh, cursory acquaintances. And they got to be nationalities. There was, um, some, uh, there was some Germans and some Austrians and some Brits and some French. And uh, I said, okay, you are. And I gave them a, 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 the general outlines of a character, roughly their age. Okay, because I wanted to make this uh, a little more impactful. And so they all got assigned a character, and that was on a Friday. And over the weekend, they had to come back with a paragraph describing their character, their, their person. And I got some surprisingly good ones and some surprisingly long ones. And um, I, I knew uh, a couple of the propensities of... Uh, a couple of the kids in the class, um, the mo the moony eyed ones, and you know, whatever, and so um, each day when they came in, they got handed a little slip of paper that had something that had impacted them. And uh, your brother was drafted. Your father was uh, called up to work in a a, a mill. You know different things that would impact um, older teenagers at the beginning of the war. And every day when they, and subsequently they came in, something, they got something. Happen, you know, something happened. Um, your, your, uh, your two brothers uh, died uh, in, in a battle over in France. Um, your sister has been uh, called up to go work in a munitions factory where people get hurt all the time. Just various things that would happen to civilians. They weren't, they weren't soldiers. They weren't soldiers or nurses. All right? They were civilians. And um, they each had occupations, hobbies, whatever from the paragraph or more that they wrote up. And so things happened. And I had a girl that was a moony-eyed romantic and I killed her boyfriend and I killed her next boyfriend. And I, I blew a leg off her third boyfriend. And I, I tried to hit him where it hurt as we developed these characters. And so, um, as, as the, the uh, uh, project proceeded, more and more stuff happened. And now some of the boys are getting drafted. It's late, it's late in the war and they're getting drafted and they don't know if they're gonna go or, or not. Um, I did draft uh, two who were um, mechanics. That's, that's what they gave their their occupation as at the beginning of the project. And um, I drafted them to be mechanics for their respective uh, air wings and their air forces. And so they didn't know. And once a week, or no, actually, every time when uh, I gave them five or 10 minutes, these were 90 minute bells, I gave them five or 10 minutes to get with their other nationality if they were a Brit, they could get with the other Brits, compare notes, see what's happening. Oh, man, that happened to you? Oh, oh look what happened to me. Or, you know, oh, and I, I try to immerse them in the fact that even being at home, not in the trenches, you were going to be very adversely affected. And it worked. I, you know, I, I got some 
really, really great um, papers at the end of the, um, the project. The Mooney-Eyed Girl that I Killed All Her Boyfriends, I had to reread it because I wasn't sure it was her. She wrote me this really beautiful moving about what an effect that the World War had had on her and in her little quiet t dairy town, you know, et cetera. Um, I, I feel that if you can reach your students in some way like that, you know, a, a World War is one thing, um, the, my project can be done in a number of different historical periods, depending upon the school district and the composition of the class. All right. Um, and uh, there are some obvious, you, you're probably not going to get into doing the Civil War because um, that's too raw a subject right now. Um, the First World War you could get into, probably not the Second World War right now because it's too woke, unfortunately. I, I did this 12, 15 years ago. And, um, yeah, I used a, for, a, a modified form of role-playing, and I found it to be very successful. Um, I may even try to market the uh, the idea. I've, I've kept all my notes and everything from when I ran it and did it. Um... I want to create my own game. I've developed a mechanic system to some extent, and I began to write a couple of different genre settings to apply the system to. What ways could, should I proceed? All right, find a mentor, editor for suggestions, or group to, group to play test what I have so far. Yes, all of those. If you don't know what you want to do with it, then I guess you probably need some help to figure out what it is you want to do with it and how to do it well. Um, what is the most effective way to assess your own work? Have somebody else look at it. Run it for other people and not just your friends. Your friends are going to be uh, uh, reticent to hurt your feelings. Take it to a small con, tell everybody it's a play test, and then get feedback after the session's over. What they like about it, what didn't they like about it. You'd be surprised how many people would be interested in playing in a play test. Brand new game. Be the first, etc., etc. And some of the feedback you're going to get is worthwhile, and some of it isn't. It's up to you to weed through it. Okay, <laughs> all right, we get through all the flowery, hail, curmudgeon things. Um, all right, this is, this is our uh, school groups that we've been talking to off and on all semester about. Ending the school year, transitioning to summer, but everything with the high school club wound down successfully. Next week, I'm set to do it two days a week as our part of our optional summer learning, like summer school, but you want to be there. Of course, I'll be doing it introducing rising ninth grade students to tabletop RPGs. Good for you. He goes on. Watsy just released a high-level adventure, Vecna, Eve of Ruin. Where's that I? I guess that's Eve. From my understanding, it's intended to take you from 10th to 20th and obviously put you right next to that oldest of named villains. Setting aside the absurdity of high-level play, oh good, I'm glad we are because, yeah, immortals and all that's just silly shit. Um, what are your thoughts on the evolution of characters like Vecna? Pure nostalgia for profit or respective, uh, respectful homage to the past? Uh, I do not believe that Watsi is capable of respectful homage to the past. I, I, don't, I don't think they have the smarts. Um, they certainly don't have not shown, I'm putting away my airplanes that I was using there for a minute ago for a model. Uh, I certainly don't think they have enough foresightedness. Um, if that were the case, they'd have done something with Vecna years ago 
and kept him alive as a constant threat, addition to addition to addition, the eye of Vecna, the hand of Vecna, okay. Um, I think it's just sleazy uh, use of, let's, let's get some more mileage out of an old name that used to have really scary connotations. Um, I don't think they do anything that's respectful. Just my opinion. A recent com commentary by YouTuber Professor DM referenced an article from Out on the Limb and Dragon 5. I'm sure you'll remember, Gandalf was only a fifth level magic user. Any thoughts or recollections on this well-known piece? Um, yeah. That was Gary's. I don't know who it's credited to. But he'd been fed up with Tolkien, 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 Tolkien. We all were fed up with Tolkien. Like Tolkien was the only source of fantasy game. Yeah. And we were fed up with it. And, you know, everybody, Gandalf and Lord of the Rings. Blah, blah, blah. Well, if you look carefully at everything Gandalf did in the, that, that, that book or those movies, there's nothing there to indicate that he's any higher than a fifth level OD and D magic user. The spells he does, the things he, he, he does, there's nothing to indicate he's any higher. Now, yeah, okay, now we get into whether he's one of those gray dudes that's been around for a thousand years and all that. Well, th this was well before the Silmarillion and all that shit. And um, it was like, big deal. He's a fifth level magic user. And there's really nothing in there that would say any differently according to OD and D. Yeah, racist stink, which is what I was looking for. Letters to the editor. You betcha. Um, okay, now this is this guy's also um the, the, this same guy about the school club. Uh, I've been successful with the school club in person weekly during the year, and I play online with my longtime friends regularly once or twice a week. Isn't that great? I'm playing with the guys in Okinawa again this coming Sunday, uh, the day after this gets released. Um, but now I have some friends and family wanting to play some D&D in person. What I'm struggling with is the frequency. Once monthly seems too shallow, every two weeks seems just right, but maybe overwhelms a newbie. What tips might you think of for getting folks started into regular play? Well, the first one would be purely, okay, I want all you to, where I would love it for all of you to sit down with me and I'm gonna teach you all about how to play this game. I'm gonna show you how to play it and no pressure. If you find this is something you like, well, then we'll talk later about playing it again or more frequently. And then I would it's just exactly what I do. I run a, a, a one off. I'd be a little Monty Hallish because you are trying to sell them, right? And so you don't sell a, a car with tarnished wheels. You shine those wheels up. So um, I, I, might be a little, I might be a little generous and maybe do a little more laughing, but that'd be hard to do without, yeah, because we, we laugh a lot at my tables anyway. But um, don't give away the, the, the the sink, but have fun. Don't be life or death. Be scary. We can make it life and near death. And do your best dog and pony show to show them the joys of role playing, the fun of role playing. And then afterwards, and again, it's going to depend on how many people you sit down that first time to do it. 
If you sit down eight, that's one thing. If you sit down five, that's another. If you sit down five, you're going to want to try and keep all five of those. Eight, you got a room for one or two to not show interest. If they want to play two, fine. But I certainly wouldn't go more than five or six with newbies all at once. Because it's like trying to herd cats. And somebody's tail is going to get rocked on. It, it just happens. But I would go there and then have a have an after game, a scheduled after game. Okay, what would you think about it? What would you like? What didn't you like? And you listen to what they liked and didn't like. Now, if they didn't like something that's an integral part of the game, well, you're just going to have to work around that and explain that, no, no, you've got to do that, or it's got to be there. Find out what they enjoyed. And give them more of it the second time. First time, play the game. Yeah, when do you want you? Who wants to play again? Yeah, what's two weeks look like from now? Or what's three? Okay, no, how about three weekends from now? Or whatever. And set a date. See how many make it. Don't set it any further ahead than you have to. Because more people are going to have stuff come up. Be a little selfish on this. Try to keep hog them to yourselves. And then, once you've played a couple of times, hey, this is fun. What do you say? Well, you know, how, how, how can we set this up? And whether you played once every two weeks, and then you you skip one, and it is three weeks. Or if you get to be regular as rain, I think you'll find it your natural spot and rhythm by polling the players. If they're uncomfortable playing every two weeks, okay, once a month. And if you have a lot of fun, somebody will go, hey, man, can we do this more and it'll pick up. It'll pick up. Low intelligence and low wisdom equals you don't know an answer but think you do. You're confidently incorrect. Low intelligence and high wisdom. You don't know and you know you don't know. You understand your limitations. Okay, just my take. Good one. And it was commented upon as pretty fair. Now, though, enforce that stat in the game where the player has a great idea or won't let a thread go despite a ruling. I find this a bit tricky. Okay, this is what I was referring to. We're going to talk about again and later. And this is later. Um, it's your job to enforce what you feel needs to be enforced in your game. And if you get somebody that just won't let it go, won't let it go, won't let it go, well, you know what? That's part of what mon wandering monsters are for. Players that are doping off and not keep paying attention and keeping their wits about them. And I don't care if it sounds like a little bit of a dickish behavior. You have to control the game. You can't let the players control you and dictate how the game's going to be played. Now, as a smart DM, you will listen, you will pay attention, and you will modify, whether consciously or subconsciously. But that's your job now as a DM. You've got to stop metagaming. When I sit down and run a wheel of blame game, which I've been doing for several years now, I tell the players the only way, the only metagaming allowed in this game is me, and I will only do it to make a point or to get a laugh. Like the time they found the giant pickle with that I described as roughly the size of the Oscar Mayer Wienermobile. Big metagaming, but it gave them the absurdity of the size of this giant pickle. I get the laugh. I get the metagame. Um, and the person responds, I agree. I see it more as a guideline for role-playing than anything else. And why I think it's important to establish how you're going to implement stats in your game. 
Well, stats are there for a reason. They are the skeleton, the, the structure, the uh, 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 matrix upon which you build your character. Pretty easy to figure. Um, for example, I don't like having players solve puzzles when their real-life intelligence factors in more than the character's stats. Okay. If, if you want to get around somebody making a leap of intuition, which, you know, hey, it happens. It's how stuff gets invented. You can always ask them to justify their conclusion or their answer. And if they got a good story, hey, this is all about making stories. They got a good story for it, fine. You got a big bullshit story. Yeah, I heard about this guy, and and, and, and this is what you do. <coughs> okay, dude, you got it. Go for it. Try it. And then you have the final say on the dice. What's he need? Because there's nothing very, very, well, yeah, very, very, very little that you just do. Chance always has to come into it. If it's anything other than eating, drinking, and defecating, and sleeping. Big adventures, big gains. Um, for example, I don't like having players, okay, um, or making players role-play persuasion checks and basing the result on their performance. No, God, no. No, I don't want acting at my table. No. Too many poor actors and wannabe uh, actors. I go through the game conventions every once in a while and go past the table full of those. Or worse yet, you got a 5e uh, DM who's up uh, strutting around and acting everything out like they're performing. Nah, we're not there to perform. I'm not going to watch you perform. We're there to have some fun. Um... Let's see, okay, I would absolutely use a wisdom check to see if the character would really stick their head in that mouth. I wouldn't. If they say they're going to do it, if they got a really wise character with a high wisdom and they don't avail themselves of that wisdom, <laughs> roll up another character. See how well you do without any head at all. Uh, or in Tomb of Horrors, I would absolutely... Uh, Oh, okay, what? I mean, okay, I'm up. Uh, I think if you go purely by the player's own judgments, meta knowledge, or our stats, you may as well just sit around and play, let's say, pretend and forget having the rules all together. Well, it, it, you can't throw away everything, no. But um, <laughs> if, if a player, if a player chooses to waste... A character, well, let them waste it. You're not there to hold their hand. And, you know, I, I wouldn't think anybody would be um, so dumb as to stick their head into a, a statue's mouth, a lion's mouth. But um, sometimes a clever, clever DM uh, will... Uh, Make make you do something that takes a leap of faith. I might. <laughs> um, okay. Now, I don't know if I, re I did this before or not. Um, all right. I'm, part of this I may have addressed earlier. Um... But during your time as editor of Dragon, I noticed some of the content that doesn't have an author credit. Most recently, I was looking at Dragon 5 and the debut of the Ankeg. I always assumed you were the creator of this and other creatures in Dragon as well as other articles without a credit. Nope. Uh, sorry, I can't confirm that. Um, so, um, in, in the very early ones, could have been a simple mistake. 
All right, it could have just been a simple mistake. Oops, we left off a byline. All right, um, I'd, I'd be the first to admit now that uh, Gary and I were flying by the seat of our pants when we decided to do this. My sole uh, publishing experience was with a college newspaper and um, dabbling around in the yearbook uh, in, in college. And I was, you know, going, Gary had established the strategic review. I took it over in its image and everything from there was seat of the pants as we learned what we were doing. So it could be that whoever did it, um, we left the name off. We might have published it in a, late, in a later episode, issue. Oh, by the way, we left off so-and-so. So we we might have. I, I, I mean, my God, that was um, 1976. Um, yeah, it would have been early 77. I just don't remember. Um, I didn't write all that stuff, no. Um, sometimes I wrote piece, weird pieces in one or the other Dragon or um, Strategic Review under a pseudonym. Um, I wrote uh, What to Do When the Dog Eats Your Dice and a couple of others um, under uh, Omar Quailish, that was the name. And those were two pit characters out of one of my original uh, campaign dungeons. Um, might have been a mistake, might have been they didn't want any credit, might have been something we were floating as a trial balloon. After all these many years, I have no specific recollections in that area. Okay, um, yeah, I agree, it's always good to have pr proper credit for your creations, and yet you'd be surprised how many people don't care about that. They just want to add something to the game. Um, since I mentioned fighting the skies, I just picked up a copy of Dawn Patrol at DaveCon. Yeah, I went to the first DaveCon. I was fortunate to meet Mike Carr and have him sign it for me. Can you talk about the decision to change the name of the, name of the game and how different is Dawn Patrol versus fighting the skies? Not at all different. Not at all different. The only thing they did was change the name. Um, I'm sure that some idiot there thought it would be a great idea to change the name um, f because of, an, of a, an old film that most of the people hadn't seen then anyway. Whereas Fight in the Skies was, a, I feel, a better title because it was exploring a whole new, literally, dimension of warfare. Some idiot decided that would be a better name. I'm sure Mike said, hey, as long as my royalty checks don't change, I don't give a damn what you call it. I think it was silly. It was probably also trying to shake the TSR reference. I don't know. It was still TSR that did it. Maybe maybe they thought it was going to sell better in... in uh, Bomb with Teller or um, a book, you know, a book or hobby shop with that name on it instead of fighting the skies. I have no idea. Um, do I have any thoughts on why Wizards of the Coast Hasbro doesn't do anything with those old properties, such as Dawn Patrol, Gamma World, Top Secret, etc.? Since I would assume they own the rights. Well, they don't own Top Secret. Um, that's owned by. Um, uh, Jason's company, uh, Merle uh, Rasmussen, has been writing new stuff for it. Um, so uh, Jason Elliott, owned his, his company, owns that. Um, I have no idea why they haven't done anything with Gamma World. It was an excellent design. Uh, I think it still stands up pretty strong. Um, why didn't they do anything with Dom Patrol? Well, I do know this. That when certain executives left, they were allowed to t take with one of their IPs. Now, I know Jim Ward took MA, Metamorphosis Alpha. I'm guessing, 
and I haven't asked him because I never thought to, that Mike took Dawn Patrol. And he was given back the, uh, the intellectual property, the IP of Dawn Patrol, just as Jim was given back MA. Um, Gamma World, I don't know where it sits. I do know, though, that Top Secret doesn't belong to them. And uh, I don't know how or why, but I know it doesn't. Um, it may have been something Jason uh, snicked in on on a lapse of trademark or something. I don't don't know. I, I wasn't involved with it. Um, that was something he was doing on the side away from Gygax magazine. And I think that brings me to the end of all the stuff. I'm just going to go over it again a minute. Um, okay. I think that's it. Now, um, by the way, I just came to my attention that the uh, Silver Boulets, a uh, consortium of uh, gamers, I have a new Kickstarter out. Um, I'll ask Jim to put a link at the end of this so you can check it out. Um, those, a funny story about the Silver Boulets. I met them quite by chance one year at Gen Con on the corner, a street corner in Indy, and said, oh, I like your shirts. And they go, oh, yeah, well, and I go, yeah, I, I invented the ballet. Oh, yeah, hey. And one of them tracked me down before the con was over and brought me a shirt that was silver ballet. So, yeah, they're good guys. Check it out. Um, I, I thought at one time they were going to be a rock band, but I'm not sure about that. Don't quote me on that. And um, until then, do da govi. Hello, and welcome to my song. Who wrote about the dungeons Now he's the feller Live from the cellar Talks about D&D And old school RPGs Still quite a feller A curmudgeon in the cellar Last man around When the rates went down Calling Gary In that Lake Geneva town Hey Gary, it's an awful mess Let me edit, we'll have success D and D and Dragon Magazine. He's a curmudgeon who wrote about the dungeons. Now he's the feller, live from the cellar. Talks about D and D and old school RPGs, but he's still quite the feller, a curmudgeon in the cellar. Magic missile, it's a mortar shell. Make it hit in the first level spell. Brought psionics to the game to attack that wizard brain. DSR and Fantasy, collection of micro armory, tight with tramp under a tree, high as could be. He's the curmudgeon who wrote about the dungeons, now he's the feller, live from the cellar. Talks about D&D and old school RPGs, but he's still quite the feller, the curmudgeon in the cellar. Still quite the feller, the curmudgeon in the cellar. Come on.